Hey, welcome everyone to the Green Mountain Care Board meeting. The first item on the agenda is the Executive Director's report. Susan Barrett. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have a few announcements. Uh, first, a couple of upcoming meetings. Next week, April 3rd, we are having a meeting in this auditorium at 9 a.m., so it's a morning meeting. And we're, uh, we've put together a panel to discuss rural, hospital, and healthcare challenges and opportunities. Uh, so it should be a very lively discussion. We have some folks, the panel hasn't been finalized. We hope to have it finalized by this afternoon. And we'll also be um, sending out a press release. But we do know we have a national speaker uh, who is coming from Maine. And then we have uh, the head of Boz, Jeff Tiemann, and then a couple of other CEOs from Vermont hospitals. Oh, and we also have Kevin Stone from the ACO. So, Stay tuned for that press release this afternoon. We hope to see everyone there next Wednesday. The other announcement is we are having a traveling board meeting. We do these twice a year, usually in the spring and in October. So we have decided we are going to Gifford Hospital, and Dan Bennett is in the audience, and he knows we're coming. We just haven't finalized the date yet, so some, sometime in uh, May. So stay tuned for that. We'll uh, have the meeting at the hospital, but then we'll also be out in the community visiting with other healthcare providers in the Randolph community. And then last, just to update the board and the public of a couple of other committees of the board who have met and are meeting next week. Uh, last week, we met with the primary care advisory group and we had a very uh, lively discussion with that group. And at the end of that meeting, uh, the group decided that the focus of their work going forward is going to be on healthcare workforce. So I thought that was a very good result of that discussion. And then next Tuesday, the data governance council meeting uh, will take place in the pavilion on the fourth floor. And I can't remember what time, but it is on our press release. I think it's two o'clock, I'm seeing. And for any new folks who haven't already done this, please sign in at the table in the back. And that's all I have to announce. Thank you. Did you want to mention at all uh, uh, job openings? Oh, that's a great idea. I would like to mention a job opening. Uh, it's actually a perfect time with a lot of the hospital folks in the audience. Um, so as many of you know, Pat Jones has moved on to another position over at Diva. Uh, so we do have an opening for the Health Systems Finance Director position, and it is to lead this remarkable team of Kelly, Lori, and Agatha. And the focus of that job is uh, the, the direction and leadership for the hospital budgets, as well as the accountable care organization budgets, and um, looking at the system as a whole, as well as the work we're doing on the all payer model. So it's a really amazing opportunity for the right person. And the posting is on our website. So please share that widely. Thank you. Okay. The next item on the agenda are the minutes of Wednesday, March 20th. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. To so moved and seconded to approve the minutes of Wednesday, March 20th without any additions, deletions, or corrections. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. So at this point, we're going to turn it over to the finance team to um, lead us through uh, really the whole afternoon. So. <laughs> That's correct. Um, I'm Lori Perry, and this is Kelly Thoreau and Agatha Kessler. And um, we unexpectedly received a um, amended great request for budget 19 from Springfield last night, so that is going to be on our agenda today. So Springfield Hospital has sent us a letter as of last night requesting a rate increase of 5% um, over their current 5%, rather than 
and they would have affected for May 1st. The increase would um, increase their estimated, their NPR, an estimated 488,924, and annualized that would be 1,173,417. Their hospital trustees did approve this request on March 12th. The reasons they gave for this request was their negative margins and they've been trying very hard to have cost containment but they're still in a tough cash position and then they recently terminated their childbirth services <coughs> to date from our information that we have um we had proposed had a submitted budget from Springfield last year of almost 60 million dollars and if this was a change of one percent to their NPR, they asked for five percent and they also are participating in all ACO programs then the board approved that particular budget and the change in the charges of the five percent the this is the chart that um, we wanted the board to be aware of because of current information, September to January, year to date 19, their operating margin is a negative 11.6%, total margin negative 18.1%, days cash on hand is 17, days payable is 69.2, and days receivable 56.2. At this time, staff does not have a recommendation because we have to go through our analysis. And Laurie, what I would ask is if you could reach out to the CEO at Springfield and find out um, uh, what would be a good meeting date in the future so that we could have a hearing with them on this. I think that um, not only um, the board, but the citizens in the Springfield area and even the the citizens of the state of Vermont are looking for as much transparency as possible and learning about um, how the turnaround is going and so on. So um, if you could do that, then we could set our timeline from that unless any board member has any objections. Sure. Okay. Thank you. We also have we'll just have a little bit Lori, we, we just went through this with Gifford and we submitted a whole bunch of requests, you know, for Gifford to submit. So you may want to follow that to we asked, request. We asked Springfield for that in advance. That's some of the materials that are on the back table and you should have received in the packet. Thank you. Okay. document is going to be trying to show you the changes from our last meeting of March 13th to the budget guidance. We also received public comment today from Boss, and then we'll also give you the next steps in our budget guidance. This particular slide is showing the whole section, the first section in our NPR fixed respective payment guidelines have been changed and we're asking um, the board is establishing the maximum growth target of X percent for individual hospitals, net patient revenue, and fixed respective payments for fiscal year 2020 over fiscal year 2019 budget. Should hospital budgets appear to be trending in 2019 and 2020 in alignment and with the overall payer model target, the GMCB also established a tentative maximum NPR FPP growth target of Y percent for fiscal year 2021 or fiscal year 2020 budget. Each hospital is required to submit an annual budget for each of the two fiscal years by July 1st of the preceding year. In addition to considering the fiscal year 2020 growth target, the GMCB will consider and each hospital should carefully consider the hospital specific financial circumstances 
including its actual fiscal year 2018 MPR FPP and expenses, and its year-to-date and projected fiscal year 2019 NPR FPP and expenses, its historical ability to manage its budget, its community needs, its operational investments for successful participation in the ACO program, and other relevant circumstances. The other um, portion of the guidance that changed is in bold at the bottom of this paragraph. Um, for hospitals with projected fiscal year 2019 NPR PP that is greater than budgeted, the GMCB would not expect to see fiscal year 2020 NPR FPP greater than X percent unless clearly justified. So rather than go any further, I think it might be good for the board to start making decision points. Um, so that we don't uh, have too much on the table for discussion in the possible motion. Would anybody like to make a motion at this time? All right, everybody's looking at me, so I guess I'm going to make a motion at this time. Um, so, what I would move. Um, I would move that we accept the budget guidelines as revised with a maximum growth target of 3.5% for individual hospitals, net patient revenue, and fixed perspective payments. Um, and that uh, we establish uh, that and that would be for 2020 uh, as well as for 2021. So the 3.5% would be the X and the Y in that first paragraph. Uh, do you want me to also address the second paragraph, Kevin, or do you want to do this one at a time? I, I think uh, the two are related, so you yeah. might as well keep going. Okay, and that we include that for hospitals with projected 19 uh, NPR and FPP that is greater than budgeted, we would not expect to see greater than, um, and I think what we, that what had been discussed or thrown out there in a previous meeting was 5%, unless clearly justified. Not for the second For I guess I'm not clear on, on what that second X should be myself, so I would want to have a discussion about that. Yeah, I think the intent is it was 3.5. Correct. The 5% was if they were below if budget, were below. like okay. more than 2%, then you could go with the 5% Oh, I see. Increase. Yes, yep. Got it. All right, so let me just get myself straight here. Okay, so let me start over. I withdraw my motion, and now I will move uh, that we accept the revised budget guideline with a 3.5% target for each of the placeholder items. Is there a second? <clears throat> second. It's been moved and seconded to uh, accept the recommendations of staff on the budget guidelines um, and inserting wherever there is an X or a Y the figure 3.5 percent is their discussion. Tom. Um, I'd like to say I, I, I like this format um, much better than the original proposal because it embeds the budget process much more directly in the welfare model construct. And that's a good thing. And I think it's a good thing to give hospitals um, um, <clears throat> much more lead time uh, to kind of manage their affairs and think about the moving parts within their hospital and how those might play out over a couple of years rather than a 12-month period. What I am concerned about is um, uh, the 3.5% and 3.5%, although I recognize that this language allows us, we aren't wedded to the 3.5% necessarily in the second year for 2021, but I, 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 I worry about the message that 35 and 35 
give is because that's at the maximum of, 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 of the all pair model. And I'm just kind of looking here at context and in terms of some of the other uh, data that, that we will be, we have or have been given, in that we're looking at the five year trends uh, in terms of NPR growth um, at 3.8% and the expense trends at 4%, which both are in excess of 3.5%. And this is at a time when the trends on acute admissions are at 1.7% and an outpatient visits at 4%. Um, and then you have you know, the biggest kind of boat in the harbor, uh, so to speak, that even though in 2018 we were looking at an overall NPR growth of 3.1%, uh, UVM, which is near 50% of the, uh, the total NPR was at 3.5% uh, 2018 over 2017, and their um, 2018 over 2017 uh, expenses were at 5.8%. So we're, we're not, um, this is being presented in the context where the, the tailwinds are still um, uh, rich, I would say, um, relative to the 3.5% target. So, um, you know, I, I would feel more, much more comfortable. Um, uh, we know that last year, collectively, overall, we came in with budgets at 3.1% growth. And for me, and you know, discussing with the board, I feel more comfortable with uh, something less in the first year of 2020, say, at 3.25% or something that basically says that, you know, um, uh, you know 3.5% the following year is our target as long as uh, we are somewhat more constrained, less constrained than last year, but more constrained than, than the overall target. Uh, I just think it's a time that we don't have enough, uh, you know, we, we only have, uh, in terms of, of hard data, we have 2018, which is the first year of the all pair model, and we have um, two quarters of 20, uh, 2019. And so by the time we get into the budget process deeply, we'll have almost three quarters of 2019 and, and be in a much better position to, uh, to, to see how things are, are trending. Um, so I guess you know, that would be, um, I would be comfortable if, if other members of the board agree to have uh, the XB 3.25% and the YB 3.5%. Is that an amendment that you are offering? Uh, you don't put yourself so much on the line if you make an amendment, but I, I, I'll move. I'll move that as an amendment to Robin's motion. So um, I'll start the discussion. I, I just think that, uh, uh, as I've stated in the past, I believe that the next two years are going to be critical to the to the success of the all payer model. And that hospitals need to have the ability to continue to uh, make the investments that over time are going to reap benefits. And um, this is at a time where they're facing such incredible pressures uh, on wage inflation. And it's across the board, um, with docs seeing some of the highest wage uh, <coughs> pressure. Um, but it's true. Of nurses, techs, cafeteria workers, you name it, we are going to um, be seeing huge pressure. I think that the initial data through uh, Q2 um, shows that we are in line, and I don't think that we should be um, creating further roadblocks for hospitals to um, make the type of investments necessary to be full participants. <laughs> I just want to uh, say that I also um, don't view it as uh, quite as wishy-washy a target in the second year. It's one thing if there are unforeseen circumstances, and I think it is, but the whole point of having a two-year target is to provide certainty and predictability for the hospitals, and I think that we would be falling back if uh, the second year was just a, a, a number to, to place on the wall, and I think that there should be a, a larger commitment from the board to stay the course unless there is something that um, I think that the hospitals and the board would all agree upon 
is an unforeseen situation. So that's my take on it. Um, I'll just add a couple of comments. I, I support some of where you're going. I mean, the past two years, the actuals have been 2.8% overall, 3.1% overall. Um, but the other part that I see kind of coming down the pike is that some of the hospitals are exceeding their performance in 2019. And the fact that we will be holding them to 3.5% against their budget, um, I think we'll end up seeing that, um, you know, actuals year over year probably will come in lower. And I'm hopeful that the hospitals that don't need three, don't grow at 3.5%, you know, their budgets will come in lower so that in total, we very well could as a system come in below the 3.5%. I think the challenge is, again, since we give out one target for all, for everybody, and everybody's not the same, that creates you know some of the big issues that we have. So I mean, I totally understand, Tom, what you're saying, and I was pushing for that as well before. I don't think we're gonna get that through, <laughs> to be honest, but, um, so I'm kind of willing to say, you know, if we go with the three and a half, there were a few hospitals that came in lower on their budget rates year over year for, for um, 18 to 19 and are already exceeding. So I think it's, they're, they're going to be challenged to stay within three and a half percent. And I brought that up at the budget meetings and there, we'll, we'll see what happens there. So I think we're going to end up, you know, actual to actual again below three and a half percent if we stick with that to budget um, right now. So. Anyone else? Justine, I'm no. Go ahead. Um, I, I'm comfortable with the three and a half for two years because I agree that we really are at a critical place in moving uh, our delivery system reform where we are starting to see some early results and change on the ground at uh, the operational level and I think that's really the hard work of this model. Um, by setting a statewide high level total cost of care target of three and a half percent, I think we've, we've actually used the low end of the all pair model range, which is actually 3.5 to 4.3, um, which were, was again, uh, as Tom knows, because I know he checked it, that that range was used because it was the historic economic growth in the state, and depending on the time period, you know, you can it, it can fall anywhere in that range. Uh, so, uh, and we've chosen to really focus on the lower end of that range at 3.5 percent. So, th those are the reasons why I am comfortable with uh, those targets. Yeah, I guess I would just sum up. Um, I hear everybody's comments, and I appreciate them all. I appreciate Tom your frugality here. Um, I do think that our workforce pressures are really systemic across the entire state, and it's putting uh, upward pressure on wages at, at all levels of the hospital delivery system. And I also think, as Robin was saying, and also as Kevin was saying, the all-care model requires major transition in how we. You know, deliver care in the state and the hospitals need headroom. And to the extent that we are at 3.5 and that some hospitals are going to have a hard time meeting that 3.5 because they're already over and other hospitals are not actually going to make the 3.5. And again, this is a target for all hospitals, but we are realizing we are going to be looking at individual budgets at the, during the budget process. And so this is a target that we're putting out there, but we reserve the right to look at individual budgets and see if this makes sense. So I'm comfortable with the 3.5 over two years. So I guess Parliament <coughs> Elementary, is there a second to the uh, motion to amend? Can you second your own motion? <laughs> <laughs> that seems to be the only option here. I would, I would, draw, I would draw the motion just because I can count heads. Thank you, Tom. I uh, appreciate that. I think that everybody uh, understands the spirit in which the uh, amendment was offered, and I think we agree with uh, the spirit. So with that, um, is there further discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. Uh, 
public comment. Oh, public comment. Oh. <laughs> public comment. Eric. I'm sorry to do that. <laughs> so, <laughs> sure, just, um, so I, I think our office would like to see two things. Is one that the board recognizes that this is a ceiling, and they expect you all expect that and hope that hospitals will negotiate um, to bring down costs. Uh, we ask a similar thing of the payers, of, of Blue Cross and MVP. Um, and I think, uh, as we've heard in last year's hospital budgets, that this is treated as a ceiling and they are going to the max. And uh, I think we should say that this is the highest things can go. Um, in recognition of the workforce challenges and the importance of uh, continued cost containment investments. What I would what our office would suggest is that there's a 2% cap, and if uh, hospitals can show that uh, they're making workforce uh, investments, development investments, and or cost containment investments, that they can then go up to 3.5, uh, provided that you know the 1.5% is due to additional uh, community health investments and workforce development investments. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Is there other public comment? Yes, Dale. Um, based on what you just said, yes, I speak would up, wonder. Louder, louder. Oh, louder? Louder, please. I don't get asked that very often. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Based on what he was saying, just an afterthought, because of the workforce challenges, I would also want a base projection of what workforce is going to cost, because I want to know how close those two are coming and if they're going to flip. Because the way workforce is going, if we get into a situation of there are so high costs coming out and what they paid for the education they're limited as far as how low they can go, which is going to raise what that base is that you've got to pay to get your workforce, if it's even available, which is a market driver in itself. I worry about those two getting too close together. Does that make sense? I think so. I mean, it's clear that um, we're, we're all very concerned about the uh, wage pressures um, that not only the medical community is facing, but it seems to be affecting every sector of the uh, Vermont economy. So, is there other public comment? Yes, Walter. Just really a comment, just um, to pick up on what Eric and Dale have said. I'm glad you're having discussion, and just please remember that the people that paid for these raises don't also get raises either and the wage pressures may the hospital may be going up or down or whatever but for us it doesn't go up and if it goes up it's insignificant usually and, and i really that appreciate being sure. what you said walter because um, one of the things that uh, is troubling is that we're tasked really with a triple a it's not just about cost containment it's about access and quality of care it is, yeah and if there aren't workers you're not going to have access and you're not going to have quality of care and also, what we hear repeatedly in the budget process is that because the hospitals know their commitment to provide the, the health care to the community, they're paying twice as much for travelers and locums. So, it, you know, we could put our heads in the sand and say, okay, we're, nobody's going to get a raise in the state of Vermont, but that could just come back and bite us too. So well, I'm actually in favor of raises for hospital workforce yep. people. It, it's just a very yeah. fine line. Jess, you want to say well, something? Well, I was just going to say what you said, which is that you know it's not just about raises of current workers. It's actually about there are waiting lines at some of these you know providers, and it's because they can't fill positions. And so we need to give them the ability to be able to hire those additional positions so that we can reduce waiting lines and increase access. And to your point about locums and these temporary workers, you know hospitals are paying two to three times what they would if they could fill that position. In the long run, that's actually not cost effective. So how do we start to think about creating a stable workforce 
so we can provide you know quality access to all Vermonters. And I think to the extent that we're facing a serious workforce shortage in the state, we need to adjust for that in the in the budget process. We're allowed for that in the budget process. So. Other public comment? Oh, yes, Mark. Uh, Mark Stanislaus from the University of Vermont Health Network. This is a very good step in the right direction to align the strategic approach that Vermont has chosen to take along the journey of the all pair model, okay? Um, you know, it still doesn't align them perfectly. Um, in the all pair model, it's a 3.5% no rate of growth, not a total growth, but this is an excellent step in that direction. So, well, so thank you. Um, and I'm just thinking out, out, out loud as we think about the financial challenges that the hospital has, all the hospitals have across our state. And as I think about this and as I listen to some of the percentages that were referenced that created some concern, the statement that I didn't hear that created some concern that when you look at 2018 actual and you take out as a total health system and you take out the University of Vermont Medical Center's margin, the, the other hospitals combined for a loss of $20 million. Okay, we're all in this together. And, 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 and so, you know, uh, you know it, it is, hospitals are not gonna be able to create increased access if their margins are in the red and they can't continue to invest in themselves. So I, I know this is a balanced conversation. There's a lot of pieces. We know that when you move, you know, one piece that impacts, you know, the other piece. Um, so, and then the other thing that I wanted to make very clear, number one, I'm not a clinician, okay? Okay, but if the patients show up at a hospital, the hospital's gonna take care of that patient's needs. So, the hospitals don't turn patients away, and if by virtue of doing that, that causes them to go over a budget to budget guidance limit. We need to be able to have open conversations about what is driving that and understanding that. Because we certainly don't want to get into a circumstance where hospitals are turning patients away just to manage to a budget to budget target. So, I mean, those are just some thoughts. I'm not looking for answers, but this is a very good step to start to align the strategic approach that the state of Vermont is taking towards healthcare for its total population. Thank you, Mark. Other public comments? Jeff. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, just a couple comments really to piggyback on, on what Mark just said. I think um, this is directionally um, correct, and, and we appreciate the, the acknowledgement of all the challenges and pressures that hospitals face. I think just to add a little, a, a tiny bit of context to it, is that we think about the all-payer model work that's sort of the centerpiece of how we're trying to change um, both the delivery and the cost side of the healthcare equation in Vermont. And you have a lot of hospitals, small, critical access, medium size, who are taking big risks to do this, making really strategic, important, long-term investments. And people in other parts of the country um, or other types of hospitals or big systems might look at that and say they don't even understand how such a small hospital, um, without being anchored by a system, could, could venture into that territory as confidently as we are here in Vermont. So I think that's just an important thing to acknowledge. Also, just a couple days ago, or I guess last month, um, the CMS Office of the Actuary came out with um, spending projections in the healthcare industry. And just a couple ones I wanted to cite. Medicare spending is projected to grow 7.4% between now and 2027. Medicaid at 5.5. Prescription drug spending at 5.6. Hospital overall spending at 5.6. And physicianal, physician and clinical services, 5.4%. So, Again, just acknowledging those uh, over that time period. Um, but in any case, um, helpful to, to see the board acknowledging these pressures and understanding the affirmative work hospitals are doing to succeed in the model. Thanks. Thanks, Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. Lori? Right. 
Next up is enforcement. So we, we still have other things on the oh, total cost of care. Yeah. And I think we would also need to do an overall vote if we're going to put it Correct. Did you want to talk about the changes to the appendix? Um, there really wasn't any changes from what we sent the previous meeting um, that I know of. If there is, I'm sorry to include that. I'm happy to comment on the total cost of care chart. I know there was some public comment from FOSS um, with a request to eliminate Appendix 11, which is the total cost of care chart that we added. Um, and I appreciated the letter, uh, but I feel strongly that we retain that table. Um, actually, as Jeff Tiemann just said, the all payer model is the centerpiece of what we're trying to achieve, and I think we need to move closer to regulatory alignment with that all payer model. And our contract with the federal government obliges us to keep the to remember per month total cost of care growth at 3.5% of the state level. We need to understand what's happening in smaller geographic areas um, if we're going to meet those federal obligations. And we need hospitals to help us unpack what's happening in their communities to assess how they can contribute to bending that cost curve. So by including this chart, I think we're really just asking hospitals to review their community's per capita spend and its growth rate, and if they're above average on either, to dig a little deeper. And it could be the demographics in their community. It could be referral patterns in that community. It could be the cost of delivering care in their hospital. And it could be enough, not enough primary prevention in their community. I mean, there could be a lot of things, and I think we need to understand that. And to the extent that the hospitals can help us understand that, I think it's important. There are resources available to help lower the administrative burden to hospitals in meeting that request. I spoke to Beth Canvin uh, this week from the Blueprint, and she's willing to work with a small group of hospitals to unpack total cost of care with their data analytics group on point and try and help understand what's happening, variations in total cost of care by HSA. So I think that's an excellent resource and it's a very generous offer. Uh, the Blueprint community profiles are incredibly helpful uh, for understanding what's happening in communities. You can actually, for example, look and hospitals with high total cost of care spend in those community profiles, you can actually see that some of those hospitals are high on advanced imaging. They're especially imaging for low back pain. They're high on all-cause readmissions. They're low on vaccination rates and preventable admissions. So there's things that you can start to unpack to understand why perhaps total cost of care variation might be happening. And it's important that we start to do that if we're gonna actually align with 3.5% across the whole state. I also spoke to Kevin Stone from OneCare who offered his help as well to anybody a part of the OneCare network to try and understand what's happening in total cost of care in the communities and to unpack data there. So I would say any hospital that is concerned about the administrative burden of trying to unpack that total cost of care numbers in those charts to please contact me and I'll help facilitate some additional resources there. But I want to reiterate, this is part of the budget process because we need to align our regulatory functions and we need hospitals to be thinking about the all-payer model financial and quality targets when they're setting their budgets. We need everyone rowing in the same direction and we need to understand that. As far as the data, vCares is the best we have. It's the same source that we're gonna be using for the all-payer model. And the calculations that our data team did for the HSA are the same ones we're gonna be doing for the state. It is the spend that we as a state are gonna be held accountable for. So again, not meant to be punitive, just meant to be informative. And we need to make sure that all we're all working together to achieve the goal of low cost, high quality care for all of our monitors. And this chart is a step in the right direction of trying to understand that. So my feeling is, despite the request to omit it from our hospital budget guidance, I would like to keep it in. Thank you, Jess. Other uh, discussion by the board? Um, I, I agree with Jess. I think that uh, we do need to have been working in various ways internally to align regulatory processes that aren't particularly transparent, I think, because they're really more staff analysis and uh, breaking down internal silos and that kind of thing. And I agree that it's time that we really move forward in aligning uh, in a more public way uh, the processes. Also, I, 
this really is our venue for collecting information from hospitals and uh, getting uh, their take on what's going on in their communities, financial and otherwise. So, um, you know, I, I agree. I don't think we want, we want to see this as a punitive kind of issue. And we would certainly understand, at least I, speaking for myself, I would certainly understand if um, the analysis in the first year is not particularly deep, quite frankly, because I think this is a new process and it makes sense that there would be some uh, some learning curve around that and maybe we'll be able to come up with an even better process next year. So I, I would encourage uh, hospitals to see this as a test and a pilot and um, to, not, to, to not worry necessarily about getting it perfect because I don't, I don't think, at least for myself, I don't expect that. I'm really just looking for uh, some initial reactions and thinking based on data that is readily available. So um, I met with uh, Ann Bennett earlier in the week, and really the first time that he had gotten a chance to see the total cost of care were the, the numbers that were uh, presented, and he didn't feel that um, speaking for himself, and I'm sure other hospitals will agree that um, he wasn't convinced it was going to be a meaningful dialogue because they didn't have the tools to um, really address the question of, a, of the appendix um, unless there was um, access given to uh, the database, which is a complicated issue in and of itself. But the fact that it's non-punitive, the fact that it's the beginning of a discussion, the fact that we all know that um, as a state we're really focused on uh, really the per capita cost of care, I think that this is a good starting point for the discussion. And I, I don't think that anybody's looking to punish any hospital that, that can't give us better data and we're not asking you to go out and spend money um, chasing the information, but I think that really the burden is going to fall upon us, and I think that Jess mentioned some, you know, great assistance that's been offered to us by both the Blueprint and by OneCare to try to get better information, and I would think that um, it's going to create more work for us, but I do think that it's um, work that's valuable, it's work that gets to you know, um, everything from variations of care, um, variations of pricing, and everything else. So I think that uh, over time it could become meaningful. Um, but again, I, I would hope that none of us would make a budget decision this year based on Appendix 11. Tom? When I first saw Jesse's chart, um, I thought this is a, a good thing. Um, and it is a good thing that uh, my sense is, in, in terms of managing a lot of budgets in a complicated environment, is that um, you know, things get tougher over time as you try to uh, kind of bend the spending curve or, or hold the spending curve to a, an agreed upon line. And so here we are, uh, barely into the second year of the all-payer model. Um, and my guess is, and we've been managing <clears throat> the approach, uh, from basically a top-down kind of point of view, like we just did in terms of voting the NPR thresholds, uh, off the top side, uh, top end operating margins, and um, and that is one arena that uh, is powerful and, and useful. But another is you know working with our clients um, to find uh, opportunities where folks can share good ideas um, and uh, work more organically uh, within the. The hospital's day-to-day -day lives to um, to bend the spending curve or to sustain the spending curve, and um, I agree with exactly with, with what Robin said that this is a start, um, and with what Kevin said that uh, let's not weigh too heavily on it um, in the first year, but let's build the infrastructure um, as we have with our staff. We are now, we now have a, a staff that is up and running, um, uh, fully loaded in terms of of, of, of managing the VCARES database. And let's try to leverage that in a way um, to find helpful ways to help hospitals um, meet the goals that we all share. 
Any other discussion? If not, would somebody like to uh, make a motion? I believe the motion would be to uh, approve the fiscal year 2020 guidance as presented to us by staff um, and as earlier amended today. I can do it. Uh, I move we uh, approve the fiscal year 2020 hospital budget guidance as provided to us by staff and amended earlier today. Is there a second? Second. Been moved and seconded. Is there discussion by the board? Seeing none, I'll open it up to public comment. Is there a comment from the public? Yes, Dale. On the total cost of care. This is a question. Um, I've noticed when I've looked at hospital budgets and when I've looked at trends in general that whenever you try to hold something to a certain percentage of growth, when you try to put it within a, a range, it always jumps out sooner or later. And that has puzzled me. Then again, it also makes sense to me. If you take 20 people and you line them up and you say, take a shallow breath, you're going to see every once in a while somebody take a deep breath. And that's what I'm getting at. When we try to control the cost, when we try to calculate total cost of care, how often does that deep breath occur it might be this hospital, it might be that hospital. If I'm looking at Diva, maybe it's so diverse that you don't see the deep breath because it gets swallowed by the average. Does somebody know the answer to that question of, do I need to allow for a deep breath? Does that create enough of an analogy to, I, I can't hold this every single year, I don't, think without something happening where a deep breath will be required. That's the analogy I'm using. I think it's going to take a lot of deep breaths. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I would just say that um, the discussion, though, was helpful because when you look back historically, um, there was nobody that said, this must change, and you're required to make changes. but. Uh, I'm going to cite the research that was done by um, Jack Winberg in his variation analysis. And when you look at two um, relatively close communities geographically, um, where if you lived in one community, you had your tonsils out routinely, and not so in the other, and then look at the work that was done on hysterectomies. And it was really, it was just the research getting out to the providers that spurred that internal conversation, and, and they changed on their own. And sometimes it just requires the discussion to occur so that people have the data and they start asking themselves the questions. So I think only positive can occur. Robin? If you don't mind, I would just add, um, I think as Maureen mentioned earlier, you know, part of what we do in the guidance is we set uh, this high level target, but if it shouldn't be a one-size-fits-all. So what we try to do through the hearing process is then tailor uh, that information based on what's actually going on in the hospital. Because as, as you, to your point, Dale, every hospital in Vermont is different. They may have some similar pressures, but they will also have unique challenges specific to their region. And so uh, to me, that's what the hearing process is for, is to take the guidance, which necessarily has to be uniform, but then tailor it uh, based on individual community circumstances. So I know, Dan, that you're itching to get a word in, so. Thanks. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair. Um, so I just wanted to comment on the total cost of care. Uh, this is something that uh, all of us who are involved in the all-payer model that we're focused on, that we have to be focused on, that's going to determine whether we're successful uh, in that model or not. So. Um, I just want to clarify, there's no, um, uh, there's no concern with working on that and whatnot. Concern is the fact that, particularly for those of us who are new to the Alpayer model, which if it is, this is our first year we just started up, we don't have this information now. 
I'm glad to hear that there are uh, some resources out there that we can turn to uh, to get access to that information and uh, ultimately to understand uh, where there are areas we need to work on. Uh, we will be working on those areas uh, when we're able to uh, better understand that. That is something everybody at our organization is going to be working on, and I know every other uh, hospital and uh, practice that is involved in this, they're going to be working on that as well. So my ultimate comment or, or, or uh, request is that if that is included in the uh, guidance and in what we're asked to respond to this year in the budget process, that it be understood that we're going to be talking about process more than we're going to be talking about specific results or a specific area where maybe we're an outlier or whatnot because we're only in the very beginning processes of even talking about that process and even getting that information. So I was glad to hear the comment that um, you know, this is something that um, uh, you know, at least in the first year, first two years, is, you're going to understand that. But I just want to state that unequivocally that we want you to understand that and to give us that opportunity to talk about the process because that's where we're going to be in, uh, that's where we're going to be in August when we come before you again is at that process level. Thank you, Dan. I appreciate that. Other public Yes, Mark. Um, I think it's a common objective that we all have to manage the total cost of care. And we're kind of feeling our way through this on, on all aspects from the hospital side to the regulatory side. Um, but I want to continue to remind everyone that more than half the total cost of care is outside of the hospital budget review process. But the hospitals that are in this and the providers that are in it are assuming 100% of the risk for that total cost of care. So we're balancing this process, we're balancing the other process, the Green Mountain Care Board, and, 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 and you know, so you know, as we focus about this, I happen to think and, and, and I could be wrong because this is a gut feel, but I think the percentages that have been managed within the oversight of the Green Mountain Care Board, that growth rate has been lower than the other growth rate. And that growth rate has been lower than the increase or th than the actual commercial ask. And this is where I get back to where actual to actual um, is important to truly understand the cost of care isn't budget to budget. It's what actually comes through the door for those patients you take care of for the payroll that you spend for those people to take care of. That's the cost of care, it's not budget to budget. Okay, so I just have to continue to remind everybody, if we continue to put the whole burden on 50% of the system, and keep in mind that there's no clear path to figure this out right now, so we have to figure it out together. But that's gonna continue to put more and more burden on the 50% that has been managing a little bit lower than that cost curve of those other two pieces and put more and more financial pressure on them than there is today. So, and, 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 and you know, keep in mind, we have to figure this out. So, and it's gonna take time to figure it out, but you know, the hospitals are only 50% of that total cost. So that's what everyone needs to remember here. Uh, um, and that 50%, if you look at actual to actual cost curves, when you look at our growth to, to those growth rates, well, that Jeff just mentioned earlier, is significantly less when you go actual to actual to almost every item that you compare it to. And I, and I think, I mean, and that's kudos to the Green Mountain Care Board, and that's kudos to all of the hospitals, but I just worry that that trend can't continue just on one side. We need to figure out a way to transition it to the other side too, and also create the accountability there. Point well taken. Other public comment? Anyone? Okay. I guess call the question. All those in favor of the motion to approve the uh, fiscal year 2020 guidance signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. Thank you, Lori. Thank you. We'll send that information out on Friday. Super. Our next topic is the enforcement and fiscal year 2018 budgets to the actual results. We will be showing you the requirements and the timeline, the enforcement policy, 
the fiscal year 18 budgets that you approved, the actual results of fiscal year 18, and further analysis of enforcement and policy triggers. We'll be showing the budget and actual operating margins and trade margins, and then your next steps. This is the timeline. Um, the hospitals are were required to send in their actual results for fiscal year 2018 by January 31st, 2019. We received all the hospitals except for one is still preliminary in the North Country Hospital. So the numbers here are still at preliminary. So take that into consideration, please. Um, so a couple of weeks ago, we gave a review of the actual results of fiscal year 18. Today is the enforcement discussion. And then based on your recommendations, we will have further action um, next month to either ask for hospitals to come in or you have your votes. And then hopefully by the end of April, we'll have letters sent out to the hospitals on your decisions. And then we will try and do a summary of the um, actions that were taken and the results in May. This is the enforcement policy currently in our guidance for fiscal year 18. There's a lot of information here. Mainly what we wanted to point out is that the uh, GMCB um, gave a, excuse me, the enforcement requirement was that the GMCB would review hospitals that were 0.5% above or below their approved NPR. This does not necessarily mean that the GMCB will take action. The budget reviews will compare each outlier to results of the total system. The reporting requirements for the review will be determined by the Fremont Peer Board. And the board will afford the hospital the opportunity for a hearing and may require a hearing if it deems one necessary. The board determines that a hospital's performance has different, differed substantially from its budget. The board may take actions including, but not limited to, reduce or increase the hospital's rates, reduce or increase net revenue or expenditure levels in the hospital's current year budget, use its finding as a consideration to adjust the hospital's budget in a subsequent year or years, and establish full budget review of actual operations for that budget year. This slide is showing what was approved for the fiscal year 18 budgets, we had a 3% target and then 4.4% increase for new health care reform investments. The board decided to rebase Porter Medical Center and the UVM Medical Center for their 19 budget decisions. The board approved Southwestern Medical Center's Dental home COA for 581,360 for the budget which was not adjusted in our database. So this has changed since um, previous um, slides on the budgets. So um, Southwestern's has changed to 160 million 78,864. And we give you the two the look of the approved budget is the top chart and then the rebase budgets for Porter and UVM are on the bottom. This chart is showing you the budget to actual, the variances, and then operating margins and total margins. This chart is showing you the trigger that's in the policy of plus or minus 0.5%. So you would have, we would probably review all the hospitals unless they were rebased, and so UVM would be, would not have to be reviewed based on this chart. The next chart we're giving you some options of looking at hospitals that are plus or minus 1%. And in this case, we would be, um, Southwestern would be fine, 
and um, Porter and UVM would be fine in their re base budget. Another scenario is looking at the hospitals, plus or minus 2%. And in this case, you would um, Brattleboro, Central Vermont, Northeastern, Rutland, Southwestern would be fine, and then Porter and UVM's rebase budget would be fine. We also wanted to show you what budgets or the hospitals that are just a positive 2% over their budgets. And that would be Montescutney, Porter Hospital, and UVM. And we would review, um, we would not review Porter and UVM with their rebase budgets. The next slide for your review is to look at the hospitals that are negative 5% actual to budget. And that would be Gifford, North Country, and Springfield. And this one is just showing you the rebates budgets. The top section, of course, would be what you originally approved. Can, can you just uh, back up one? And because uh, I'm not sure the public uh, uh, that was at the uh, last uh, meeting is probably aware of. What has changed at North Country in the reporting to put them here? North Country, um, we presented to you the actual results on March 13th. Um, North Country had given us their NPR and FPP number. It was by email. It was not submitted into our adaptive product, our adapt database. Since then, Porter, excuse me, North Country, called us last night and said that those numbers were wrong and gave us the correct numbers. So that's why you're seeing this variance of over 5%. Okay. Excuse me. Kevin, uh, just I you know, had a discussion with Lori this morning about that as well. And what did change is, um, what did not change were the operating margins. Those are as they were presented to us earlier. So the connectivity between uh, NPR and operating margins uh, was not affected uh, in that these operating margins are the same that you saw on, on the uh, original, original chart we had. We would have caught some of these issues if things changed if it was in the database. So we were just going by emails of what these figures were. How are they coming with their software change? You <laughs> held out with the main contact. Yeah, I'm in contact with them a couple times a week at this point, and they're still updating us on um, when she's completed uh, various tasks. So um, they have a few more sheets to enter. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful it'll be soon, but I don't have an estimated time. Thank you. You're welcome. So the next slide is looking at the <coughs> Uh, hospitals that had rebase budgets, so you can see a comparison of what you were approved for the fiscal year 18 and then what was rebased for those hospitals to jump off from for the fiscal year 19 budgets. And we wanted to give you also an idea of what's happening on the operating margins and total margins for all the hospitals what they budgeted and what they actually came in. So the next steps would be uh, your direction, what you would want staff to do, any hustles you would uh, want to contact, and um, then possible voting on their enforcement later on in the month. So I guess it's really uh, at a point where it's time for the board to decide what is the uh, percentage that is going to trigger a uh, enforcement hearing, not not necessarily um, an enforcement action. And uh, does anyone on the board wish to start the conversation? Maureen? Sure. Um, I had worked with staff earlier, and 
you know, one of the charts that I had them put in was the plus 2% for the, on the upside and the minus 5% on the downside for, you know, actually potentially looking at enforcement. Um, and then the other chart that also, you know, I think is, needs to be discussed is the next page as well, which is the rebase budget. And the reason I say that is because I feel the hospitals own their budgets and they came in here last August and they presented the top part of the chart. And at that point they had 10 months of data. Um, although their budget, you know, they may not have been working off that, they actually, with what they submitted to us, they still had 10 months of data. We rebased their budgets based on actuals because there was no way, you know, they were already going to, UVM, for instance, would have had to been down year over year. So that was the right thing to do. Um, I'm just throwing out, I don't know what we want to do, but I, I don't want to rule out rebase budgets from any enforcement. Last year for Porter, we didn't do anything for enforcement. We rebased them, but we didn't, we didn't do anything as far as any um, enforcement action. And you know, they came in significantly higher. Um, you know, UVM came in $44 million over their budget. And that's again what they presented to us. We threw out this rebase last year. So I don't have an answer to it. I'm just throwing it out as discussion that I wouldn't rule those hospitals out, you know, from being rebased. Um, you know, and I do want to point out a couple of other things when you go to slide um, six. And I mean, this is also what uh, Mark is getting at a little bit, which is when we look at um, the variance, and for right now, because hospitals didn't rebase on the operating margin as well, so I just want to look at, you know, in total, we had a $22 million overage um, on NPR. And if we go over to the operating margin, which came in at $28 million on the operating margin, not the total margin, the budget was $67 million. So we had a $22 million increase on the top line against budget and a $40 million miss on the operating margin. Um, and then when you look at the particular hospitals, many of that um, is coming from hospitals that missed their top line numbers and were not able to correct expenses based on where their top line was trending. And, and that's one of the things we've been trying to really press that we can't have aspirational budgets, we're calling them if you want, to have stuff missing the top line, but we're not cutting the expenses. So, you know, the total margin corrected somewhat, but a lot of that's because investor portfolios did well. And, you know, when you look at just the operating margin, which is expenses to revenue, um, the change was really significant. Um, and, you know, to the point of when we go to, when we looked before at our total system-wide, we were up 3.1% um, on actuals for NPR, but we were up 5% on expenses. And the expense base is about $2.5 billion, so that 1.9% change between revenue and expenses increases is almost $50 million. And that's what we're seeing here. Um, so I know it's a lot of it is the challenges the hospitals are facing. I'm, I don't know how we, we solve that. Um, but I, I just think it's really important when we look at, you know, there are eight hospitals there that missed their top line numbers some of them very significantly, and their operating margins are significantly in the red. And, you know, and we know Springfield is one of them, Gifford, and when we're looking at North Country. And that's why when we're talking about enforcement, and last year we only rebased hospitals that were up on the higher end. We didn't do anything for hospitals that fell short, and we said we'll kind of watch it. I think we need to rebase some of the hospitals that are, are falling short of their numbers. Um, otherwise, we're going to be in more trouble with, with getting significant losses. So based on that conversation, Maureen, do you wish to make a motion that would uh, include those hospitals that you believe that enforcement hearing should be scheduled for, not taking action, but basically giving them the opportunity to um, come before us and answer some questions? 
Um, you know, I think we should, yeah, let's have a little bit more discussion of where people are. I think some of the other concerns are in some of the hospitals, even if they were higher, they may be missing their operating margin as well. And some people may want to, you know, we may want to look at um, whether the 5% down is enough and captures those hospitals that maybe fell in it, you know, a 3% down but are losing a lot of money as well. So um, I think let's have a discussion first and then, if, you know, then, we, then I would raise that. Um. Okay, other discussion? Go ahead, Tom. <clears throat> trying to catch up to uh, the 5% the column. Um, I just would like to go to chart on page six, which I think you're already there, um, and just make a couple of observations that, and this is consistent with what Maureen was saying, if you look at the operating margin column, you'll see that the total operating mar margin uh, for all hospitals was 28.4, 28.5 million, um, and that uh, the operating margin for UVM uh, MC was 46.1 uh, million. And what that means is that the total operating margin for all the rest of the 13 hospitals was a negative $17.7 .7 million. And so there's a concentration there. Um, and you, you, you can also see that uh, on the total margin uh, column, a little less uh, uh, strident, but uh, still you have um, UVM occupying $71 million on the total margin, which is 74% of the total margin, yet UVM comprises only 49.7% uh, of you know, all, you know, all, all the hospital um, uh, NPR. So, um, and I, I don't make this point to point at UVM, I do make the point to, put, to point at something which I don't think we can deal with here, but I think that we need to be aware of, which is payer mix. Is that <laughs> some hospitals are in a position, um, given the service areas that, that, that they serve, that they can, um, uh, for example, cost shift onto the commercial payers uh, for what they don't get from Medicare or Medicaid. And um, so I, as we go through this process, I, I don't want to, um, and certainly there's gotta be some enforcement here, but some, uh, some of, of it seems to me to be some unfairness in how payer mixes are, are, are distributed. Um, that is the lay of the land today. It's not something we're gonna change here, but I think just looking at these numbers where, you know, I think UVM has a payer mix close to 60% commercial, um, where um, you go to some of these other uh, uh, hospitals, they're down in the low 40s. Um, that is a, uh, a huge differential, and it's something that I think that we have to keep in mind and maybe use this process to expose better uh, those issues so those that can solve the problem uh, might take some action. Okay, other discussion? Uh, yeah. I would just throw out one more. If we look at page 13. And I think this is just a discussion for the board as far as, you know, if we want to look at, you know, any other hospitals for potential enforcement. Um, if you look at the far right column, which has the hospitals that actually came in, um, what their total margins were, and those that are in the red, and Gifford and Springfield would be picked up in the minus 5% that we talked about. Copley had a minus 3% on their, on their revenue side, but is losing you know, a significant shift in the 2.2 million they lost at margin and the negative 1.6. So, um, you know, having them come before us doesn't mean we're gonna take any action, but I, you know, I would probably throw that into the mix as well with you know, the hospitals that are losing and if anybody wants, we could even open it up more based on you know just the total operating margin and some of the changes there, where hospitals were able to make it up. And again, we'd have to dig into how they did it, but some of it is is based on investment performance, which may or may not repeat. You know can, that can go the other way. So you know we want to be looking at are hospitals able to stand alone on their operating margin in total. 
um, and that would put Northwestern in that mix as, as well as Central Vermont, although they kind of turned it around, um, you know, with their margins. So, you know, just want to throw out a couple ideas for people, you know, as far as what you want included, and that would be another thing rather than just, you know, we're focusing on the NPR, but then marrying that up with their operating margins as well to determine, you know, if there's a mix there where we at least want to have them come in. And again, a lot of this is just concern for, you know, their sustainability, their financial viability, how are things going this year, so that we're not surprised later. You know, we already have seen Gifford come back and ask for a rate change. Springfield's come back and ask for rate changes. Um, you know, we don't want to run into similar situations next year, so. That's a, a really good point, Maureen, and um, regardless of whether we decide to have a um, enforcement hearing for Copley, um, I believe that it would make sense for the board to invite um, the chair of their board and uh, members of the uh, COPLA team to meet with us anyways to give us an update because given the fact that um, they lost a key member due to a death, they're losing a key um, executive due to um, a change, and uh, they're struggling because of the health of one of their key practitioners. I think that they've done some amazing work and are being applauded to for what they've been done to still manage to um, what they had come before us with in August. But I think it would be helpful if we just heard from them and, and uh, you know got an update on where that process is, how they're going to conduct their search, you know what when the, the change might occur. Um, so even outside of the enforcement, if, if we don't um, decide to have an enforcement hearing for Copley, I think it would be wise for us to invite them in just to, you know, update us and let us know what's going on, so. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. So other thoughts from the board? Uh, I, I totally agree on Copley. Personally, I would, I, I, I guess I'm having a, like a process question. Um, I feel like for enforcement, uh, it needs to be consistent with our enforcement guidance statute and rule that was put out, which means that, um, that I think we need to have kind of a standardized approach. Um, but I do think that we can do uh, informational meetings separate from that um, to because of other issues that are going on other th that could present future problems. So I think what I would do personally is the plus 2%, uh, I don't know if the right number is minus 3 or minus 5% on the down, um, but I would pick a number and then if there were other hospitals that we have concerns unrelated to their budget performance but based on other factors that we know were going on, that we invite them to come talk with us. I mean, I look to Mike in terms of uh, thinking through sort of the legal process piece, but at least for me, I'm a little more comfortable having it be uh, pretty structured and almost rule down because I think that is kind of necessary due to the legal nature of this. But that's, you know, everybody knows I'm a lawyer, so <laughs> I tend to fall back on that. No, I think you do have to have um, consistency and, you know, you can't pick and choose. I would just say, though, that. Um, Given what we put out for guidance last year, which is different than this coming year, um, it was that half a percent, and we made it very clear in the rebasing that um, it really um, wasn't impacting this year. So you could technically make an argument that every single hospital could be called, but I think that would be a tremendous waste of our resources. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we um, certainly realize that um, Budgets are exactly that, that nobody has a crystal ball and is going to come in exactly correct. If we could do that, we probably wouldn't be sitting here. Um, so I, I think that uh, you made some very valid points, Robin, and uh, you know, that's kind of where I'm falling, similar to where we fell last year with um, the 2% figure. 
again, I don't know either on the downside of whether it should be three or five percent. And you know, again, I would just keep pointing out that this is really just having a hearing on it, and this is not making a decision one way or the other. Anybody else? I guess I would say the hospitals that I'm most interested in hearing from with respect to the financial concerns are Gifford North Country, Springfield, and Copley. So it um, sounds like 3% under is the trigger uh, on the downside. You know, I'm concerned about financial sustainability of those hospitals and missing their mark by that much with expense grosses growth that's higher than that. So to the extent that having them come in and tell us their story and what's happening, I think would be very informative. And again, it doesn't always lead to some enforcement mechanism, but hearing what's happening is really important to the board's decision-making process. On the top side, I guess I would say plus two. So that would include them down the scut and hearing what's happening there. I'm sorry, what would you say on the top Mount, side? Mount of Scutney on the positive side would be the, would be the plus two, two percent over. Um, do you have any position on the rebased budgets? I do not have a position on the rebased budgets. We rebased them, and therefore they don't trigger that 2%. Well, they do trigger it because the rebase was very clear of what the effective period was for the rebasing. True. So. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I don't know that there'll be action taken, um, but I do feel strongly that they should come in if they exceeded the amounts, and, and that's, again, because, you know, when they came in and presented in August, um, and their year end is in September, and they were tracking to exceed a number, of, they, they own the budgets that they came in with. Um, we just, you know, did the rebase because they were very unrealistic at that time, so we, we did do a rebase. So we may do nothing, and, and uh, you know, but I, I do think we should at least have the discussion to make sure to help that when we go through the budget process this year, that people will be putting in, you know, or under, you know putting in a comparison against where they're actually trying to be. Is anybody prepared to make a motion at this point in time? Can we talk a little bit more about the rebase before we do that? Sure. <laughs> uh, and I apologize because I did not go back and review. I didn't quite understand what the rebase issue was in the slide, so I did not go back and review the decision <coughs> around the rebased budget. But has Mike made a ruling? I believe that we can re that we can review it if the rebase is outside of the budget guidance because you have to read those two things together. Um, okay, so I, I mean, I'd be more comfortable having our general counsel look at the rebase issue to make sure that it's that we can do that because I, I think it's not just a matter of what's said in the budget order, it has to be read together with the guidance. So perhaps we could, could it, would, it, would people be willing to kind of come back to that issue next week? I, th I think we definitely could come back to the issue. Um, in my mind, I remember it as the motion being stated a certain way, but I think it doesn't hurt to do the research to make sure that I'm not wrong. <laughs> so, um, you know, I think we, we could make a motion and at least get the ball rolling as far as getting hearings scheduled yes. um, yeah. outside of the question on the um, two rebase hospitals. So if, if somebody could make it. Uh, Can I interrupt? I think the hospital budget team would like to yeah. say something. Sure. Well, one thing before you guys do make a motion. Um, we did, we do want to note that um, for a negative number, for that negative threshold, you would want to make that negative 2.5 
um, because Copley actually came in at a negative 2.64, which would also make um, Northwestern come in as they were in at a negative 2.65. I just wanted to make sure you were clear that if you did set it at a negative 3.0%, it would not include Copley. So I'll, I'll make a motion for discussion. Uh, I move that we request uh, hospitals to come in if their budgets were 2% above on NPR, FPP, year end for fiscal year 2018, and or negative 2.5 below on NPR, FPP. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. I'll open it up for discussion. I'll just start by saying that uh, I'm going to support this motion because I think we have to start someplace. But it, it doesn't address all the fears that I have about where some of the budgets are headed. And although I hate to do this because I know I'm going to be hearing from some people, I'll, I'll use an example. Um, the hospital in my hometown um, would not be subject to an enforcement hearing under this. And yet, if you look at their five-year growth trend on um, expense growth, um, it's very troubling. So, um, but I think that that'll be a good discussion for this upcoming budget process. And I, I can live with uh, where we're headed on here because I think we do have to be consistent. You know, I'm not sure if. 2% of the above and 2.5% below are the exact number, but it's it's a good discussion point. And again, these are just hearings, and there may be no action that occurs coming out of that. Other discussion? Maureen? Uh, so the rebase budget, are we just going to wait until Mike gets back on the ruling about that? Yes, I think we have to at this point. Um, so again, this is not um, the final say on who those hospitals are in total, but it gives us a chance to really um, start to do the logistics so that we can bring people in and have the discussions. And so um, you know, I look forward to having those discussions. I'm sure that our team will do a, a really thorough job with trying to ask some good questions, and uh, we'll go from there. Other discussion from the board? I just said it. I think you know we're in a different climate right now, and I think our the um, the meeting that we're having on Wednesday about the health of rural hospitals and the challenges they face go part and parcel to this entire conversation about the worries about those hospitals in particular that are not meeting their top line numbers and have expense growth that exceeds their revenue growth. And so I think this is, the board is really taking on some interesting challenges and in trying to figure out how to ensure the, the health of our rural hospitals. And so these are. I think it'll be multiple conversations that are going to help us learn and the public learn what's really facing our rural hospitals. That's not unique necessarily Vermont, excuse me, Vermont, but also nationally. And how do we address these challenges? So, I, like you, I'm excited about this process of learning. Okay, I'll open it up to the public for public comment. Yes, Dale. Um, so as I was listening to the conversation, I decided to look up uh, feedback loops. I, I didn't quite catch that, Dale. Feedback loops. Okay. Which they're in biology, they're in electronics, they're in economics, they're in psychology. They're, they're, everything has feedback loops. So my comment is, I'm wondering if that's something that we're missing. I mean, hospitals do have feedback loops. Um, healthcare does, population health does, but they don't have one year cycles. They have much shorter cycles. So I'm wondering <coughs> as the hospitals get into these kind of scenarios, is the issue that they need feedback 
on what their economics is like every three months. It, it's got to be, there's got to be a feedback loop in there that you would design, somebody designs, and you check in with the feedback loop as much as you do the hospital, but the feedback loop is working for you in between when you actually do the hospital reviews. Would that help resolve some of these issues? It's a thought, it, it's an idea, it's not, it's not complete. So we are getting feedback on a monthly basis as they um, present their um, actual performance. And there are a couple of hospitals that uh, are now um, having a conversation with me monthly as we try to ask questions about what we see in those monthly reports. And, um, you know, I don't think that for most hospitals it's surprise what they're witnessing, but it also doesn't hurt to have the conversations. And so I, I think there is a feedback loop, whether or not it's sufficient or not, deal. We will always walk that line. We're trying to find out, you know, what's the, the right amount of um, requests that we have for any hospital and when do we exceed that and become excessive and become a cost to the system that's not creating better outcomes. So it, it's a tough one. Other public comment or questions? Yes, Mark. Um, you know, speaking on behalf of the University of Vermont Medical Center in Porter, you know, you know, we're happy to come in and have a conversation, but it's the same presentation that we did back when we talked about this before. So there's no new information about what's driving this. It's the exact same presentation that was done as before. So we're very happy to come and have that conversation if the board so chooses. But I think that information is already out there. I, I also want to put out there that I think it was in 2017 that we actually you know, requested a rebasing at that time and we were turned down. So at least on the medical center, this is related to a population shift within the state. That presentation is no different than what was, what was shared before. Porter's story is no different than what was shared before. So, I mean, happy to come in, change the date on the presentation, have the conversations all over again, but what is driving the variance in 18 to 17 actual is the same explanation of why 18 needed to be rebased going into the 19 budget process. So, I just wanted to share that with the board. Thank you, Mark. Other public comment questions? I don't see any. Um, so I'll call the question. All those in favor of the motion to um, ask the staff to set up um, enforcement uh, discussion hearings with hospital budgets that were exceeded 2% uh, above or um, were a negative 2.5% or more below. I think I have the motion correct, do I, Robin? Yes. Further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? So, Lori, you and the team will get these scheduled. Yes, we will. Um, Agatha, do you to make a comment on the actual results presentation? Great. Just a quick comment in the spirit of version control. Um, as you heard today, there were some, um, up, there's some updated data to FY18 Actual's report, which is the basis of a lot of this conversation. North Country's data was considered preliminary in that report, and it has since been updated to us informally, but not in our adaptive software, and also Southwestern's FY18 approved budget as a result of the dental home. So that all that updated data is reflected in Lori's presentation, but not in the FY18 actuals report that is posted to the Green Mountain Care Board website. So I wanted to say that for um, version control, what's posted on the Green Mountain Care Board's website will be updated, but it will not be updated until North Country submits an adaptive. 
So just be cautious as you review that report because now some of the system-wide calculations are no longer accurate. Thank you for that. So now, uh, one of the things that I always find fascinating <laughs> is the Vermont Healthcare Expenditure Analysis and uh, take it away. My team is going to reserve me and give you one of these responses for any questions. <laughs> Now we we're talking about 2020 guidance, we were talking about 19 amended budgets and 18 after. We're going to go to 2017 Vermont Health Care Expenditure Analysis. Uh, the topics through this um, presentation will be I'll give you an introduction. We're going to have a relationship to the total cost of care, a summary, and then dive right into Vermont resident analysis and the spending and growth, how Vermont compares to the national health expenditures of NHG from CMS, and then we also have another perspective called the provider analysis where we look at the revenues received and the growth um, trending for the providers. We also will have a chart on hospital revenues and migration of hospital inpatient discharges. There's a uh, slide where we compare the two perspectives and I'll explain to you why they're not going to be the same amount. And then we also have a projection of the resident analysis and the provider analysis for fiscal years 18 and 19. And then the appendix. The expenditure analysis has been in existence, the Vermont healthcare expenditure analysis, since 1991. And it has been an annual report and it estimates the um, future health care spending and covering, a, excuse me, future health care spending covering a period of at least two years. The report examines the spending trends and sources of funds. It compares Vermont to the national data reflected in what's called national health accounts produced by Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, CMS. And it quantifies total spending for all health care services provided in Vermont for residents and non-residents and for services provided to Vermonters regardless of site of service. These two symbols on the sides where you have an R is going to be presented on all the slides when it's a resident analysis. The P is going to be saying it's provider analysis. They're two different populations. We wanted, I wanted to show you or briefly mention to you the relationship of the VICHA to the total cost of care. The VICHA <coughs> measures expenditures at a broader and more comprehensive level than the total cost of care measures that are in the all-payer accountable care organization model agreement between Vermont and CMS. The um, total Can cost we just of, refer to it as the expenditure analysis yes. rather than the <laughs> I, I get so sick of these acronyms. Sure, sure. Um, but the expenditure analysis is all the expenditures for Vermont residents. The total cost of care is certain populations and um, such as Vermont residents without, exclude certain populations and Vermonters without insurance. And it does not take into consideration the uh, FEP plan or it's called Federal Employee Health Benefits Plan. The Vermont um, the expenditure analysis includes all people receiving care in Vermont and outside of Vermont. The, uh, total cost of care only focuses on Vermont residents. The um, all-payer model is limited to claims payments and for services covered by Medicare, for types of services covered by Medicare or non-claims payments related to direct medical care such as care management and capitation. 
The all payer model of total cost of care does not include retail pharmacy, the expenditure analysis. <coughs> The summary of the expenditure analysis is that Vermont residents' expenditures <coughs> increased 1.7% from 2016. This was lower than the 3.7% increase in 2016, and it is an average annual increase of 3.2% for the period of 2012 through 2017. Commercial insurance spending increased 2.5%, and this was mainly due to the admin and net cost of insurance, other professionals, and other unclassified and dentists. Medicare spending increased 0.8% as a result of utilization in hospitals, other professionals, and admin and net cost of insurance. Medicaid spending decreased 0.2%, mainly due to the decrease caused by the rebates, um, rebates were utilized because they had higher rebate percentages for specialty drugs, but this also was offset by the increases in mental health and other government activities. Vermont has seen a payer shift over time for healthcare services. From 2009 through 17, the percentage of total residence costs paid by commercial insurers decreased from 38% to 34%. Out of pocket, decreased from 15% to 14%, but in contrast, Medicaid grew from 25% to 27%, and Medicare grew 19% to 21%. When we compare ourselves to the U.S., um, again, we increased 1.7% from 16, but the United States increased 3.8% in their total spending. Vermont was lower, and in the 16 increased by 3.7%. The U.S. was lower by 5%. Per person spending or per capita, Vermont was 9,667, an increase of 1.8%. This was lower than the United States per capita amount of 10,229. Vermont health care share of gross domestic product is 18.5% and the United States is 17.1%. On the provider analysis, we were seeing health care service revenues received by Vermont providers for in and out of state patients increase 3.3% in 2017. This was a little higher than 2016 by 3.2%, but lower than the average annual increase of 3.8% for the period 2012 to 2017. There was growth reported in the hosp um, hospitals, 3.2%, and this includes the employed physicians that the hospitals have acquired. The revenues increased 24.1% for vision and DME, 7.2% for home health, 5.5% for physicians, 3.9% for dentists, 3.8% for other professionals, 2.8% for nursing homes. But this was offset by drugs and supplies of 0.9%. Lot of numbers there. This chart is showing you through the years 2012 to 2017 the growth between the years, the growth between the payers and also the provider and the facilities. So when I was quoting you a lot of those numbers, that this is the chart where I would get a lot of the information. The um, total annual spending growth, this is showing you that it was in 2012 with 3.1% and now we're at 1.7% increase. We are at $6 billion for 2017. We have spent the, um, we are spending in these categories. So hospitals were over $2 billion. Mental health and government activities is $796 million. These are in the, um, 
says thousands on the bottom, but it's the total expenditures is six billion. Just kind of emphasize that. So the increase in spending was $100.4 million, or 1.7% over 2016. We saw increases in categories such as admin and net cost of insurance in the commercial pair. Vision and DME was seeing increases in out-of-pocket. Other professionals uh, increases were seen in commercial insurance. Medicare saw increases <coughs> in hospitals and in mental health and other government activities, such as mental health clinics, home and community-based services, reported increases in Medicaid. This chart is trying to show you where it went. So the, again, this is in and out of state spending in $6 billion. So the majority was the hospitals. But then um, the other categories were drugs and supplies. That drugs and supplies was 12% of total spending. Physicians are 15%. This is a chart showing you that commercial insurance is 34% of the spending, but 51% of our enrollment. Comment on this chart? Sure. Um, so I think um, one thing that might be helpful to a point that Mark Stanislav made earlier uh, for future versions um, would be to also show the percentage of commercial that's self-insured. Because when you look at uh, the part of the commercial sector that we have in our uh, rate review program, which is the fully insured market, it's uh, actually a minority of this 51 percent most of the commercial sector are um, the self-insured market federal employees military medicare advantage so um, maybe that's someplace else in here but i just wanted to to mention that that might be an additional uh, helpful chart that will help people track the numbers more closely to our other regulatory uh, so you were talking about this particular information. I can't actually see it from Sorry, here, probably. <laughs> yeah. But this is in for anybody's reference. This yeah. is on slide 42. Thank you, Lori. So I, I basically wanted to show you because of the spending how it um, the population doesn't necessarily follow the spending. And this one is almost looking like Pac-Man, but um, this is where it came from. This is the repairs. So most of the spending came from health insurance, and then the majority was for other governments and um, out of pocket. Commercial insurance, we, we split it up so that you see what the pairs are, the categories that are increasing in those particular pairs. And commercial spending was 50 million, uh, increased 50 million to 2 billion. And this increase was mainly from admin and net cost of insurance and other professionals. The decreases were reported in hospitals, physicians, and drugs and supplies. Um, a question had come up in the previous expenditure analysis where our people have getting their services. And it was noted that we had in-state um, spending of 75 to 76%. So that's not too, too bad. And then the commercial insurance insured increased 2.2% from 2016. Lori, can I ask you a question on sure. that? Sure. Um, I think I asked you this before, but just uh, for um, edification. You, on the commercial insurance, you're looking at admin and net cost of health insurance. And I, my understanding now is that that includes amounts put in reserves. Yes. Yes. 
spending decreased 3.7 million to 1.7 billion. Um, they also saw increases in, like I mentioned, mental health and other government activities and admin and net cost of insurance, hospitals, nursing homes, and physicians. But what I found was interesting is they saw decreases in drugs and supplies <coughs> due to reduced spending on higher rebates for specialty drugs. When I was looking at this particular pair, they had uh, a large increase in their spending, but it was offset by these rebates, which was pretty substantial. Um, they have, for in-state spending, is between 85 and 86 percent. This is probably not surprising it's for Medicaid. And their enrollment decreased 4.3 percent from the previous year. Medicare um, increased 10.2 million to 1.3 billion, and this was mainly from hospital spending. There also was increases in other professionals and admin net cost of insurance. Their in-state spending is between 73 and 68 percent. They, um, their, but what I saw was that some of their spending was decreased in their drugs and prescriptions, and that was from out of state. They were getting it mainly from out of state. Um, their Medicaid enrollment has expanded to 2% over 2016. And this chart is what Tom was talking about. Is that this has come up um, the last few years as wide as there is such a swing sometimes for commercial insurance or even for the expenditure analysis. The admin and net cost of health insurance leads this um, most of the time. Uh, and I thought I'd give you a look at why, especially commercial insurance, the pieces that causes their admin and net cost of insurance to drop or be increased. And as Tom brought up, the change in surplus or reserves is the one that causes the big swings. Um, I also wanted to point out, Medicare and Medicaid also have admin net cost of insurance, but they don't have the change in surplus like commercial. This slide is trying to show you what categories of service are bought by government versus private um, payers, such as ourselves and out of pocket. Comparing um, 2017 to 2009, government payers accounted for 34 percent of the spending and 51% of the population, as I showed you in the previous slide. Medicare accounted for 21% of the spending and 21% of the insured. Medicaid accounted for 27% of Vermont spending and 24% of the population. Out of pocket as a percent of total spending has been about the same. This then is doing similar, but showing you by the different categories of service. In Vermont, when we compare ourselves to national health expenditures, um, Vermont is compared in the uh, state health expenditures a lot. And that is usually only published every five years. 
And um, the last one was for the data of 2014, and that was published in 2017. So when you compare Vermont, or if your question, why Vermont is so high, a lot of it is we have better data, detailed data, specific data, and we also have a aging population, and we are more generous in our Medicaid pair. So this brings us to the detail behind these numbers. This chart is showing you that CMS will show you the national health expenditures, the health consumption expenditures, and personal health care. And then you have the Vermont expenditure analysis. We compare ourselves mainly to the health consumption expenditures because the other category includes equipment, research, and structures, and also investments. Vermont does not track that. So um, the total spending, as I mentioned in the summary, the CMS data increased 3.8%. We increased 1.7% for spending. Our per capita is 1.8% increase. The United States is 3.2%. And our share of the gross domestic product is 18.5%, and the U.S. is 17.1%. And then we show you the different charts for growth trends, comparing ourselves to the U.S. using the healthcare consumption expenditures. Total spending growth, per capita growth, per capita again, and this is showing the dollars. And this one is showing the um, share of the gross domestic product, Vermont versus the United States. Um, Vermont's gross domestic product has increased, but our population has been decreasing. And now we move on to the provider analysis. This summarizes the revenue growth by the payers that um, provides um, funding to the providers. And we usually receive direct information from the hospitals, home health care, and the nursing homes. The rest of the analysis is mainly information from the census, the uh, CMS national health expenditures, and um, other sources. Can you back up to the uh the slide that uh, compares to the gross product. And I just want to point out that, uh, you know, people often say, why did healthcare reform had to have to occur? And, you know, the simple answer is that is that the growth in healthcare was greater than, than what was sustainable in the economy. And when you look at that chart there, it, it's a, a glimmer of hope and a glimmer that what we're doing is moving us in the right direction. As you can see the spread between Vermont as a percentage of its economy and um, the variance uh, to the rest of the country really is starting to uh, come together. So I, I just throw it out there that Hopefully this is a sign that we're doing things right. So the um, provider analysis is now 6.2 billion. It's a $197 million increase of 3.3% from 2017. Um, we saw Medicare and commercial payers account for the increases in revenues <coughs> in the hospital. We also want to make note that the hospitals make up about 42% of the total revenues 
in the help um, provider analysis. This chart is showing the growth over time. Um, revenues increased from 5.2 billion in 2012 to 6.2 billion in 2017. Some of the, the shifts in these growths is also, we are trying to improve our analysis, so sometimes it depends on where we're getting our data. You might have a little bit of a, a jump or, or a drop in the growth. The community hospital revenues by payer, and then we also wanted to show you the physicians that are um, physician revenue in the hospitals. The 14 community hospitals are have approximately 16% of their revenue as physician revenue. And um, they have over a, a little bit over a thousand FTBs that are physicians, over 13,000 of non-MD FTEs. And for 2017, hospitals reported 231 travelers and we're hearing that is increasing. This chart I think just used to look like this one is to kind of like this is showing you the in and out of state patients for 2000 uh, actually in 2016 um, uniform hospital discharge data set. So we're reporting this in 2017. But what I found was interesting is each hospital will have different shifts in their um, out-of-state out patients, but overall the state is seeing only about 13% between 2015 and 17. This is the, the chart where we compare the resident analysis and the provider analysis. I wanted to make note for you, the resident analysis does not have hospital physicians, that's at zero, but the provider analysis will show that because we have that data. The hospital physicians are included in the physician category on the resident analysis. The resident analysis has admin and net cost of health insurance. The provider analysis does not. Take a look at drugs and supplies. The resident analysis will include the rebates. The provider analysis does not because we do not have that data. This year I um, provided you projections um, for the resident analysis and the provider analysis. And the resident analysis is based on information provided by um, payers, if they're able to give me the data, and also based on the trends we saw in the last few years um, for the payer and the provider and facilities. The provider analysis projection is um, based on what we're, I'm seeing for trends, but also we receive um, or I collect data from the national health expenditures and they have inflation factors. So I have taken that into consideration for the projections. And in this chart, because of our budget process, we're able to have the hospitals projected 18 and approved 19 community hospital budgets are included in this chart. And then the rest is appendixes if you wanted to go through them or not. This is the matrix with all the different cells of where we get our data for the resident. And the coding of the color, meaning where allocations are applied, where we're getting direct information, and where we're getting estimates from the national health 
expenditures. This is showing you the commercial matrix because our commercial includes self-insured, but we also include workers' comp. There's long-term care in, this, in commercial. There's Medicaid stuff. Um, there is other um, non-major med categories in this uh, commercial payer. And this is the provider matrix. This was the chart I showed earlier on enrollment. And the sources we get enrollment in from it enrollment is from the ASSR, which is the Annual Statement Supplemental Report. We collect that from the insurers about the time that they send in the annual statements to the NAIC. We also receive information from the Vermont Household Health Insurance Survey, VCARES, DIVA, and also um, I've had reports from uh, the Dartmouth Institute to help us with the Medicare before we were having Medicare in these years. This is showing you what the national health expenditures, how they record their data. Vermont, we use the personal health care and the health consumption expenditures. We do not account for the dark blue, which is the investments, research, and structures and equipment. And again, this is talking about the national health expenditure that I mentioned before. And the links, if people want them, these are my sources. And I'd like to definitely acknowledge my hospital budget team, my um, peers at the Green Mountain Care Board, um, the Agency of Human Services, they did the Medicaid data. And <coughs> And, many, and D, uh, DFR for workers' comp. I could not do this report without other people. <laughs> and Dave's got our link for the Tableau Interactive that will be ready tomorrow. Any questions? Any improvements? I just want to uh, start out by uh, thanking you. I know this is a, a lot of very hard work and a lot of hard work by a number of people. And um, we probably could spend a half an hour on each one of the, the graphs or tables um, for a broader discussion. And I think that this is just the beginning of the discussion. I'm sure that you're going to be um, fielding a lot of questions as people start to digest the information and um, try to uh, more fully understand uh, what, what they've just seen. So. Um, thank you in advance. Questions from the board? I don't have a question. I'd just like to echo your thanks because this is one of, I probably shouldn't say this out loud in a public meeting, but this is one of my favorite reports um, <laughs> because I just, I feel like it really provides us with information about our healthcare landscape um, in all the different components um, in enough detail that you can really start to see how things are changing. So thank you, thank you, thank you. You're welcome. The, this report will be on the website for this meeting, but it also is on the website under the expenditure analysis, and we also have a manual on how to use the expenditure analysis. Lori, can you just talk a little bit about the Tableau Interactive? This is a new feature. That is a new feature. So can you just talk a little bit about people who can expect they go online and, and use it? Um, yes, basically, um, you should be able to see it for multiple years, but I also think I need to phone a friend um, because I haven't used it enough myself. And I think that it's gonna be very helpful so people can see if you move different levers, what are your trends gonna look like? If you wanna see what is happening to out of pocket, you should be able to see that in this um, interactive data. And, um, we are only going to be having it for the resident analysis. It is not for provider. Because VCURES is also our support, and VCURES is the resident side of the business. So um, I stay tuned. I think it's going to be better 
um, and we're going to be having other types of um, interactive tools. I believe we might be having hospital budget information and others. We were just talking about it today. David wants to definitely expand. We should say who David is. He's um, in our data. Part of the 18. Part of the 18. <laughs> yeah, I've played around with it a little bit online, and I think it's it's kind of interesting because you really can tailor the graph to what information you yourself are looking for. So it basically allows uh, for different looks than what we might pr provide in this report. So if folks have something specific they want to look to, then the Tableau Interactive may be able to help. The Tableau is, you can access it if you go under our data analytics and then go to analytic reports. And you should be able to link to expenditure analysis. I should say that <clears throat> all the data that feeds the report are downloadable. If there's a look that we're not automatically providing, um, you can kind of take a look for yourself. Um, also, my thanks for the long hard work. And I had a question, the video I just missed it in here, but when you go to slide 15, and a few slides after that where it talks about um, in-state spending for commercially insured was about 75%, and then it did the same for I think, um, Medicaid was, uh, Medicare was 68% in 2017, and Medicaid was 86%. Mm -hmm. And do we have a slide that shows where all of the, you know, what the total is for all of the out-of-state spending by Vermonters and by category? Because I just wonder, you know, whether there's anything there if we saw it was heavier skewed to a percentage, you know, of hospitals. You, you yes, did bring up drugs. Yes, we did. Yeah, okay. I mean, I don't have a slide, but I have the documents. If you would like to see that. Well, we talked, you know, one of the hospital charts that showed there that 13% of the hospital spending was from out of state. And what we don't have by category is how much was out of state for Vermonters. And where are they spending? Are they spending more, you know, in different categories, you know, disproportionately? Just, you know, it's because we're, you know, we're always worried about like, what's going on in the state, but there are a lot of people going out of state, you know, people live elsewhere in the parts of the year and things like that. But just wonder if there are any trends there of where that's changing. Right. So that's where I had made note, I had noticed a, a blip, we'll call it, for the drugs for Medicare. Yeah. Yes. Thanks. You're welcome. Yeah. Again, this is this is a, a huge amount of work, and it's the kind of thing that uh, it's like a library. You can go back to it when you, you need to know something because uh, it's it's just a nice integrated report. I have um, just I'm looking at slide 42. at the, uh, so this is health insurance coverage. Some of, some of your Medicaid numbers uh, include nursing homes and, and other kind of, uh, uh, you know, kind of non-insurance based <coughs> benefits that, that people can get from Medicaid. But I'm wondering, so I'm wondering here on the line that describes Medicaid caseload, you can see this very rapid increase from 2013 at 127,000 to uh, 2014, 146,000, peaking in 2015 at 161,000. And that was the point in time where, you know, all the problems that folks have with Vermont Health Connect were um, at, at, at their crescendo. And then you can see the drop in enrollment down uh, to 2017 to 150. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm told, and you can track this through the emergency board, uh, which, which tracks caseload, that um, a, a lot of this drop is just cleaning up the files. And I'm wondering, you know, because I don't, uh, whether or not these Medicaid numbers have been scrubbed for the reconciliations uh, of the Medicaid caseload um, uh, in those years where they, they uh, um, were off by quite a bit. I'd have to ask that question, and also these particular 
the enrollment numbers are supposed to be as of the end December 31st of 2000 or whatever year we are asking for. So I could ask you're asking if they were scrubbed. Well, that's a, this is the word, but I mean they. You know, they, I, I think that through the emergency board, you, if you read the emergency board minutes, you can see that they systematically up through up to 2018 were going through their caseload and, 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 and reconciling it for people, some that were eligible but some weren't, some that were pulled into different categories of Medicaid assistance that were, you know, weren't correct. And so if by 2018, they were back on track with a, um, a, a Medicaid record of caseload that people felt they could rely upon. Okay, other questions or comments from the board? If not, I'll open it up to the public. Questions or comments? Yes, Eric. I just want to thank the board so much for putting this together and really, you know, it's a huge effort to compile and generate and put this all together, but also the movement of the board to thinking about how the information is consumed and put it in on Tableau, and I promised Dave and Sarah to not pay me to say this, but it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's absolutely wonderful, and I think it's, at least for our shop, it's causing us to think about how we share information differently or would like to, and it's, it's a massive task, and it's been very well executed. So I really want to thank you for that comment, Eric, because it couldn't come at a better time because we were just bombarded um, with uh, a very negative um, email that said that the board never tries to communicate to the public in a way that the public can understand. And these are the type of innovative things by moving to the Tableau software that we're trying to do to, to help make whatever product we come up with actually useful for the public and something that they can you know, manipulate around for their own particular research purposes or what have you. And um, so thank you for that. We don't often get compliments. So thank you. <laughs> especially from the healthcare app. Yeah, especially for me. <laughs> I couldn't let that go in. <laughs> Other public comments or questions? Yes, Mark. I still have a couple of thoughts, but just to kind of share, I don't know if this is, you know, why, but the upturn in Medicaid can be directly related to the ACA conversion that we peaked in 2015. And as all of the exchange were being set up, well, Vermont was early, and this was, I think this was in Robin's prior, you know, prior role, but um, there was a lot more people that came off from other insurance plans and actually went on to Medicaid more than we thought was going to go to commercial um, exchange. Well, so that's part of the uptick there, I bet. Um, and then the other thing, uh, under the drugs on the Vermont Medicaid, and I forget which year this happened. So, but Vermont Medicaid took away the 340B discount, so that's probably why the drug costs went down in that year. I don't that's know for sure. The drug costs went down. down yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, the drug, well, I, I mean, you know, that difference in payments, you know, that was borne by the providers, candidly. Um, uh, but still, uh, um, so I was just speaking to specific events that I think spoke to, you know, what changed an out of trend number. Um, and it may or may, they may or may not be correct. Um, just on your point around the Medicaid enrollment, I, I think most of what we saw in terms of new Medicaid enrollment was out of the uninsured uh, population, but there was at the same time, just to make it more complicated, a change in the way that income was calculated for the purpose but, of Medicaid eligibility, yeah, um, and that did shift people from yeah, CAT amount yeah, a into, large from CAT. Uh, yeah. into Medicaid, yeah. and, and that was the income change component that was hard to estimate. Yeah. And, and, and I think, well, that trend is basically what you saw for all of the states that expanded with their Medicare you know, coverage were related to the ACA components. Well, and we had a 3% drop in the Yeah. Any other public comment or questions? Seeing none. Um, again, thank you, Lori. Um, I think you're going to be uh, pestered for a little while as we all um, take questions while we're driving or what have you. And, uh, 
So also, if the board can think of other, we'll talk about we call them spotlights or anything that you'd like to dig into for me or my coworkers. Please let us know. We've already got a request from uh, the joint fiscal office with some questions for Lori. So hot off the presses. You'll be busy. Thank you. You're welcome. So uh, at this point, uh, is there any old business to come before the board? And I guess I just wanted to uh, update the board and the public that um, yesterday um, was an exciting day for me. I got to go to Washington to meet with um, the key people who work on innovation um, at AHHS, our, our partners in the all-payer model. And um, what is so refreshing, you know, too often people think that government is broken. And I would say that you can always find an instance where you would think that government is broken. But here was a classic case of the fact that you had some truly incredible public servants with a huge knowledge base. And to think that um, we were sitting around at the table, um, the, the envoy from Vermont included the governor and the secretary of AHS and um, the director of healthcare reform. And you sit there and you think that, you know, just because there's a change in administrations that things aren't gonna get followed through on. And here was a case where you had a different team in Vermont than what was in place when the all-payer model was signed and a different team in Washington that was in place than when the all-payer model was signed and yet everybody was still with their heads down working on the work um, because it doesn't matter what your political philosophy is, at the end of the day, everybody knows that people need to have quality health care with good access and high quality at an affordable cost. And that's really what um, that group of individuals in Washington is working on. So um, a refreshing day for me, a long day, um, but one that uh, I will always remember. Any new business to come before the board? Seeing none, is there a motion to adjourn? Second. It's been moved and seconded to adjourn. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your day.